Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Jeff H. and MRSL. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. We touched on this last week, but with the base Model Y now under $47,000, it's $759 less than the average new car selling price in the United States, when in the middle of last year, it was $20,000 more. And the Model 3 in the black is now $7,800 more affordable than the average new car price in the US. Tesla Roddy highlighted a few different filings that showed Tesla is looking to expand in Fremont and specifically on the second floor. This is always going on, but here's why it's interesting now. If you've been watching Electrified now for a while, you may remember late last year, Tesla Roddy reported confirming with sources that Fremont was chosen for the task of kicking off Cybertruck pack manufacturing. So Tesla is potentially taking 4680 sales from Cato Road, assembling them into modules and packs in Fremont, and then they'll ship them to Austin to go into the Cybertruck. Tesla Asia tweeted out certain non-Tesla vehicles can now charge at selected superchargers and destination charger stations in China. The more non-Tesla vehicles using Tesla superchargers in the Tesla app getting into the ecosystem, the better. Don't take my word. A Goldman Sachs analyst said, we estimate the incremental revenue opportunity could be one to three billion dollars in a few years just from opening up the supercharger network, which could drive 15 to 75 cents of incremental EPS. The CNEV Post has stopped reporting the Tesla weekly insurance registration data, but Tesla Chan has seemingly picked up the task. So here's that data plugged into the table. And if you wanted to compare to the same week in quarter one, that number was 7,496. So, so far Tesla is ahead of pace relative to Q1. Adding up the first three weeks of quarter one, the total was 22.2 thousand adding up the first three weeks of quarter two, and the total is 29.7 thousand. Off to a great start. And we're not going to stay here, but here's that same data in bar chart form, so pause if you'd like. I've yet to find a new reliable source for the BYD figures, but I'll keep looking. I know this song scrubbing with timecode feature has been around now for a while, but I'd also venture to guess not everybody is aware that it's there, so just passing it along. Did you guys happen to see that Nvidia is currently trading around 26 times sales and 160 times earnings? Meanwhile, here are Tesla's numbers. And no, let me be clear, I'm not trying to argue I think Tesla should be valued like Nvidia right now, not at all, that would be a topic for a separate video. So just for fun, if we take Tesla's trailing 12 months earnings per share times the same PE ratio Nvidia has right now, that would be a share price of $544. And if we take Tesla's trailing 12 months of total revenue, aka sales, multiplied by the current Nvidia price to sales ratio of 26, that would give Tesla a market cap of $2.2 trillion. Right now, Tesla's market cap has been hovering just over $500 billion, so just something to think about. In another new note from Morgan Stanley on Tesla stock, they say with few exceptions, we expect the EV programs of legacy OEMs to remain loss making for years to come. And this was prior to Tesla's most recent price cuts. And a point that is really worth talking about, they say the price for being a competitor in the EV world dominated by Tesla and the Chinese OEMs may be to surrender to accept being a smaller company. So how many legacy OEMs will choose to keep their EV prices higher to try to generate some margin versus getting into the price war and trying to gain market share? It's a huge question. There's also a narrative out there that the IRA tax credits are going to level the playing field when it comes to EVs, but Morgan Stanley actually disagrees, saying the relative scale and cost advantages still stand out and can represent gaps in operating margin that can be measured in thousands of basis points. Our reading of IRA incentive structure for EVs is that it is significantly more positive for Tesla than non-Tesla players, potentially widening the gap in cost performance. I don't always agree with Jonas and Morgan Stanley, but in this case, I definitely do. I loved this chart from Roland. This could be Tesla unwinding the wave. It could be Giga Berlin ramping. It could be Tesla having some extra inventory rolling over. Either way, each line here is Tesla sales in Norway for the first month of the quarter. And you can see in April, things are drastically different. So something to keep an eye on. Tesla's impact report for 2022 came out and it's a beast of a document, incredibly detailed, very impressive from Tesla. If you have time, I'd encourage you to leaf through it. 
But if you don't, I did, so let's run through the highlights. And be ready to pause if you wanna read more because we're going to go fast. A huge point we all need to internalize, a sustainable energy economy globally will require about half of the actual energy of the fossil fuel economy. Why? Because sustainable sources are much more efficient. Tesla has published the world's first battery passport, which is basically a digitally traced shipment of their cobalt sourcing using blockchain technology. Why blockchain? Because it's immutable and it's public, so if it was private, people can adjust it and change it when if it's public on the blockchain, that can't happen. If you've been around the space, you'll know that there are some not great things that take place in the DRC when it comes to cobalt sourcing. So Tesla has created a fair cobalt alliance in a founding membership role focused on improving this situation. So that paired with his new battery passport is really awesome to see. Further, Tesla has actually got rid of 12 cobalt suppliers and they've increased their direct sourcing of cobalt to 55%, which was only 50% in 2021. That whole narrative that Tesla is bad because they're anti-union thing, well, how about this data? The effective per hour pay for manufacturing roles at Tesla works out to $32.28. Meanwhile, according to the BLS, the average median wage for production associates is only $17.87, so Tesla is almost paying double the going rate. This topic deserves a video of its own, but Tesla is continually using its connected vehicles to analyze every single real world crash, as well as millions of simulations to continue to make changes to make the vehicles safer using real world data. The study of injuries has been accelerated by the creation of automated data pipelines and by leveraging machine learning to analyze large data sets. We all love to analyze gross margins and they're all different depending on which factory the cars are coming from, but don't ever forget with each new factory, it's almost a brand new design from a first principle standpoint. I don't need to explain why the Shanghai layout is so much more efficient than the Fremont layout and we can think about Giga Mexico and future factories being even more revolutionary. And not just in the factory layout, but in what's going on in the factory. I'm thinking about the new modular manufacturing strategy that Tesla has planned for the next gen vehicle. So any competitor modeling itself after Shanghai or Austin is already going to be behind by the time the next gen factories come online. In case you saw this slide where it said the global supercharger network was 100% renewable in 2022, it's because this was achieved through annual renewable matching. Google actually put out a post a few years ago talking about they got to 100% renewable energy through this matching. Basically for every kilowatt hour of electricity they consumed, they also purchased a kilowatt hour of renewable energy. It doesn't have to be in the same location or even at the same time. It's really just these companies buying enough renewable energy from anywhere to offset its energy use. It would have been nice to get a percentage split between on-site renewable and this matching, but sadly we did not. How about that narrative that Teslas are terrible for the environment because when these batteries hit the end of life, they're just gonna end up at a landfill and yada yada. Well, that's actually not true. Tesla said none of our batteries, manufacturing scrap or fleet returns go to landfills. Tesla is basically storing all of them that they can't recycle yet for the future when the technology is ready to do so. And yes, Tesla is already recycling at Giga Nevada. Look at the numbers from 2021 to 2022 in terms of metric tons, 1500 of nickel to 2300, 200 cobalt up to 300, and 300 of copper up to 900 in just one year's time. And they've also started lithium recovery as well. When it comes to battery retention, Tesla said that on average vehicles in the US get scrapped after about 200,000 miles. And at that point, Tesla's on average Model S and X, because they've been out in the wild longer, they have more data, they only lose 12% of their capacity on average. No surprise here, but Universum for 2022 said that SpaceX and Tesla were still the top two destinations for engineers looking to work. This will play out in incredible ways in the long run. Outside of one year dating back to 2010, Tesla has grown its employee headcount every single year, adding 29,000 employees globally last year. Given that Tesla had 3.6 million job applicants in 2022, we can be fairly confident Tesla is not going to lack 
talent. That whole Tesla uses way more water than any other automaker narrative, well, that one also is dead. It's actually the opposite. Tesla is leading the industry in terms of water use per vehicle manufactured. And credit where it's due, BMW is right up there with them. If Tesla ever does choose to advertise, it will definitely not have a shortage of talking points. My honest takeaway from the report, it just reiterates how much Tesla cares about doing well for the environment and all of the things they're working on way down through the supply chain to put these reports together and tell the world what it's really up to. Look, at the end of the day, Tesla is just built different. They are mission driven and mission focused and that's part of why so many people around the world love this company. Here we have GM and Samsung starting a new joint venture, investing about $3 billion to build a battery plant in the United States. I think they're talking about expected start of production in 2026, and they're aiming for annual production capacity of 30 gigawatt hours, and they're set to make high nickel prismatic and cylindrical battery cells. And how about this from GM? We just got its earnings, but potentially much bigger news. They're planning to end production of the Chevy Bolt models by the end of this year. Now, yes, I know that the cells they use in these cars are the older non-Altium batteries, but still. We saw that in quarter one of this year, GM reached over 20,000 EV sales in the United States. Well, as you can see, 19,700 of those were the Chevy Bolt EV or the EUV. This was one of the few competitive advantages in the EV market for GM playing in that sub $30,000 category. When it comes to GM's earnings for the first quarter, they did actually beat on EPS and revenue and they upped their guidance for some metrics for this year. Here are the numbers. I have not had a chance to dive into them. I've really just been going through the Tesla impact report and GM CFO said they don't think they need to match Tesla's recent price cuts saying they feel good about where they're priced right now. And an update on Cruise, they're now up to around 240 driverless autonomous vehicles operating in San Francisco. However, the cruise division still lost $561 million in the first quarter. Kyle Vogt, the CEO of Cruise, said the cruise is now running 24-7 across all of San Francisco, but there are some disclaimers. It's only a small portion of their fleet now serving driverless rides 24 hours a day. The fully driverless cars will only be available to Cruise's power users who are members of the public who get free rides in exchange for testing out beta features. It's really only the customers who ride in cruises vehicles between 10 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. that are actually paying for their trips. And that's only in the Northwest section of San Francisco. But most importantly, the billion or trillion dollar question is how scalable is this technology to other cities? For me personally, I definitely have my doubts. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.